And now, an Arizona PBS original production. Our playing fields provide thrills, but they also bring dangers. And a lot of people that have concussions don't really recognize themselves after the fact. You have to learn your new identity. She's had multiple concussions. Now her learning and even her emotions are changed forever. How one young athlete learns to cope with the consequences. You kind of get turned upside down. Football is the most watched sport in America. The push is on to make football helmets safer and smarter. We're looking for the holy grail to try to decrease the risk of concussions in football. And how can teams change the warrior culture that keeps many athletes from speaking up when they take a serious blow to the head. In the video we're producing, for example, we're not really using fear appeals. We're making more of a rational or, or narrative appeal to them. That's coming up next on Catalyst. Catalyst is supported by Knowledge Enterprise Development at Arizona State University. Advancing entrepreneurship, innovation, discovery, and knowledge for the public good. Life has problems. Science turns them into questions that can lead to solutions and even innovations. This is Catalyst, shaping the future through science research at Arizona State University. Getting hurt, the saying goes, is all part of playing the game. But what about the injuries that we cannot see? I'm Professor Vanessa Ruiz, and you're watching Catalyst. Sprained ankles, torn ligaments, if you're very unlucky, maybe a broken leg, a broken wrist, even a dislocated shoulder. Now, medicine has learned how to fix a lot of these injuries that could happen here, from the neck down. But it's those injuries that happen here, the head, especially inside of it, for example, concussions, that are now getting a lot of attention. Now, concussions are something you really can't see on the playing field but they are some of the worst injuries an athlete can suffer and they can change an athlete's life forever. I was a very competitive person. I was an athlete. That's how I defined myself. I was in that athlete group. And then all of a sudden I, I couldn't play anymore. I had to find something else that would define me. Stephanie Cahill was a typical high achieving athlete. She was a straight A student, a first stringer on her volleyball team. But all this changed when Stephanie got two concussions while playing the game she loves. I've had five concussions in total, and the first two were from volleyball. The first one, I was not even on the field. I was on the sidelines refing. It actually hit on the side of my head, and I lost hearing on the other side for 24 hours. And then the second one was also from a jump serve that went poorly, but that was actually while I was on the court and it was from my own team member. Um, they just hit the angle wrong and it caused tunnel vision for about 12 hours. I continued to play after both of them, which was the bad decision. <laughs> a concussion is defined as a traumatic biochemical change in the brain. And what that means is there is an injury or insult to the brain that causes change in the normal way the brain functions. After those first two concussions, Stephanie was much more vulnerable to head injuries. And while playing with some friends, she suffered a third concussion. That third one would turn her life upside down. I didn't even recognize myself anymore, and a lot of people that have concussions don't really recognize themselves after the fact. You have to learn your new identity. We know that multiple concussions or even single concussions can cause some permanent cognitive deficits. When you get to that point, people have different symptoms such as memory loss, uh, behavioral changes, depression. You forget things like who your friends are, who you are sometimes. It's a very weird experience that is really hard to describe unless you're like in it can't focus on an object and track appropriately. That's one test we use. Another test we use is having you look at a fixed point and move your head uh, to make sure that people don't develop headaches or symptoms. That's called the vestibular ocular reflex. After the third concussion, my eyes kind of tilted, so I would see things at a tilt. So when I walked into a classroom without like adjusting, I might actually walk into the door or on the side. And that actually happened a lot while I was in high school, when I just got back, which obviously for a 16-year-old was embarrassing. 
One of the major things that I had to relearn how to do after the concussion was tracking my reading. So I could not read right afterwards. It would take hours to read something that just would take other people like 15 minutes because my brain could not track the words afterwards. When I'm studying, I will not just read the textbook, but I'll actually have the textbook uh, be read to me, mostly because of my tracking issues. And I just pull it up and I highlight wherever I want it to speak. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Alt Escape. In 2000, the United Nations Millennium Summit adopted eight Millennium Development Goals to be achieved by 2015. And I would just do that for the whole entire textbook, whatever chapter I'm reading. And when it's auditory, I can remember it, I can understand it. But when it's just an old fashioned textbook, my eyes won't track um, the words that are going across. So I'll um, immediately forget what I read and have to reread it and it would just take forever. So this is really cool way to study for my problems that I have and experience. People like Stephanie, who get multiple concussions, are facing the risk of developing a brain disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. CTE is a degenerative disease, and it can cause a variety of symptoms, including memory loss, aggressive behavior, and also dementia. And you're playing with probably the biggest humans on Earth. Repetitive concussive injuries is really the one thing that separates CTE from any other kind of like head trauma. Now research shows it's just the repetitive milder concussions have the most effect you know, neurologically. It seems like there is a change in the biochemical composition uh, around the brain and in the brain due to these repetitive forces that leads to this degeneration of these certain portions of the brain. The damage from the trauma is the aggregation of a protein, it's called tau. And what happens is that the nerve cell gets full of this tau, and it's not able to perform its normal functions like action potential, sending information, releasing serotonin, for example, is a really important one in, in a lot of these neuropsychiatric conditions. The nerve cell ends up dying, and the synapses pull back. So these connections cannot be made anymore. In the simplest term is that the, the nerve cell becomes choked out. The areas of the brains that are affected are quite unique. Uh, one of the areas of the brain is called the amygdala, and this is an area of the brain that's associated with a lot of depression, anxiety, rage, uh, a lot of these areas of the brain that um, are really sensitive to impacts. When I was at the doctors, they didn't really discuss the emotional aspects of it. They only kind of discussed the physical, like you might experience the headache that a lot of people have, um, the reading issues, the walking issues. They didn't really talk about how it was going to affect you personally and how it was going to affect your emotions. You kind of get turned upside down. Now the devastation that CTE can cause has scientists and athletes looking for better ways to prevent concussions. And one of the very first things getting a lot of attention, helmets. We're looking for the holy grail to try to decrease the risk of concussions in football. And obviously you think about equipment and equipment modifications to see if they can lower that risk or potentially eliminate the risk of concussion in football. Helmets did a really good job of keeping the skull intact, but in terms of its ability to protect the brain or the force that's generated, it hasn't been as good. If you look at helmet history and development, the, the plastic shell was really kind of your seatbelt in some senses, right? It, it provided a very specific function, but what was missing was the airbag. And so that's, that's a lot of the innovation that's come since then. We've, we've introduced new strategies in between that rigid shell and the head to better absorb energy, which is exactly the airbag. Zenith makes helmets. They're creating a new helmet that uses air pressure to slow down the speed of the head's movement inside the helmet. It's called the shock bonnet. Uh, there are two critical components that, that really fuel the innovation behind the, the shock bonnet. Uh, one is the shock itself, which is an uh, injected uh, piece. So unlike traditional helmets that are more foam based uh, for the energy absorbing characteristics, ours is an, actually a, a sealed air pocket with a small orifice on the top that allows for air to escape. The way this works and the way it benefits across the range of impact energies is that when it's hit hard or at a high speed, that air is trying to escape altogether. So it actually stiffens the system, 
and allows it to absorb more energy at that high packed side of the, of the spectrum. As far as safety goes, we, we know that we can wrap an athlete in bubble wrap and, and have them go and bounce off of each other on the field, but that takes away what we love and what's exciting about the sport as a whole. This isn't a real brain, it's a jello mold, but it does help us make a point. A bit like gelatin, our brains are soft and flexible, and in a sense, our brains float inside of our skulls. Now, when we get a concussion, the soft brain takes a shock as it bumps up against the inside of the hard skull. That jolt can bruise the brain, it can tear and stretch nerve tissue, and all of that can cause a chemical change inside the brain that can lead to CTE. But if you can slow down the head and reduce the impact with a protective layer, you might reduce that shock energy of the brain hitting the inside of the skull. It's the deceleration of the head ultimately, or the ability to decelerate an opponent, for example, that, that's actually quite crucial. Uh, there are a number of factors that go into this. Helmet weight is one of them, so the inertial properties of the helmet, the offset, what we call essentially the standoff between the shell and the head. So the more time you can give for that impact to be absorbed, the lower the impulse will be as well for that impact. In our Zenith laboratory, we have engineers, test technicians focusing on drop testing, as well as uh, pneumatic RAM testing specifically to really identify opportunities for innovation and ensuring the robustness and durability of the helmet as well. Rydell is the other big name in helmets. Rydell is taking a different approach in making safer helmets. Their ideas include using sensors inside custom-fitted helmets that can monitor what's going on with a player's head. Riddell has a technology called Precision Fit uh, that's been used largely at the elite levels uh, for the last couple of years, but I think that technology will find its way to younger athletes uh, as time goes by. Um, I mean, imagine a parent or a football coach uh, being able to use a phone app to scan the surface of their players' heads and upload that data to Riddell and, and get back custom or best fit helmets for their players based on those head scans. Um, then I think uh, the helmets will get more personalized in a different way too and I think that's based on the impact sensor data that we're collecting on the field. So within this helmet, this sensor sits as close to the player's head as you can get under the overliner that actually touches the player's head. What a team or a program does is at the beginning of the season, they sync up every single student athlete or player from their team to an interactive online platform called the Insight Training Tool. So the Insight Training Tool takes head impact data that you get from the football field and puts it onto an interactive website where an entire team, program, or staff could access that information. During a practice or a game, a player experiences a significant impact based off millions and millions of, of data points and impacts for their level and position group, the coach or trainer, whomever's holding the monitors on the sideline would be notified to that impact. I think, you know, there'll be a time five years from now maybe that it'll be difficult to purchase a helmet that doesn't have some sort of impact sensor array in it. Um, and, and when that becomes really ubiquitous, then you can monitor the impact characteristics of a particular player and make suggestions for how their helmet might change to meet their playing style and the, the impact characteristics that they're seeing. The way that concussions happen is basically force. So if you take too much force, the sensor goes off, the individual has to leave the field. Very simple. It's not that complicated. And whether the individual decides, you know, I, I don't have a head injury, they don't know that. They can't feel it but the sensor can feel the force. There's only so far those things can go. At some point, you're likely gonna to have to talk to an athlete about whether or not they're experiencing symptoms, and if they're motivated to hide those, you might miss a diagnosis. Social scientists at ASU are finding better ways for athletes to speak up about concussions. Their project is part of a concussion prevention initiative called Mind Matters, and it's sponsored by the National Collegiate Association and the Department of Defense. So we're using something called a socio-ecological approach, and that's an approach to health communication that has been developed over the past several years, and it says you can't just look at individual health decisions uh, in a vacuum, because people are embedded in larger systems. So if you think of it kind of like an onion, 
their sort of individual tendencies uh, at the center, uh, but around those are the influences of groups and organizations, and around that is a context of uh, social and cultural factors that influence all three. Social scientists study how people's beliefs affect their attitudes and behaviors. Those sets of beliefs are known as vested interests, and in sports, there is one belief that is very powerful. The vested interest that gives us the most reason for concern is immediacy. So although athletes tend to know that there are long-term potential consequences from concussion like CTE and old age, they see those consequences as far off in the future and not something that affects them right now. So that we think is one thing that's keeping athletes from uh, reporting concussions is they don't think it's an immediate problem. I wanted to be able to play and to win and be a part of that. So I just decided that it wasn't going to be that big of a deal um, if I continued to play, but little did I know it was, it was going to be a big deal. From the guys that I spoke to personally, the older NFL guys who, who are now in their 70s and 80s, you just didn't feel really tough talking about you know, having a concussion. You just took the hits and kept on going. It's a difficult way to ask the patient who's in a heat of battle, whose adrenaline is flowing, they're in the middle of competition, they're trying to win a big game, trying to do their role to say, okay, I might be hurt, so it's time for me to come out. That goes against everything that every football player ever believes and is ever taught. Teams have cultures, they have certain norms and values and expectations of their athletes, and these influence the athletes uh, decisions about whether to uh, report concussions or not. They don't want to feel like they're letting down their team or they might think the norm of their team is to keep going even if you're injured. And then at the larger level there are cultural narratives about sport. One of them is the masculine warrior and you can see the masculine warrior narrative playing out in any Sunday football game. You watch when they're talking about the toughness of the players or how uh, how hard they work or how they play through pain, those kinds of narratives influence both the organizational culture and individual level as well. Head injuries affect every aspect of your life. A concussion can severely degrade your performance in the classroom. Reporting and getting treated for any head injury could prevent you from bombing that exam or even from blowing that play. Steve Corman and his research team are producing a documentary that teaches athletes the short-term dangers of playing through a concussion. Do you want to let your teammates down with a crucial penalty because your brain is scrambled? If you take a tough hit to the head, report it. If you see your teammate take a tough hit and can't get the play call, take them to the trainer. We're trying to get athletes to recognize uh, severe head impacts and concussions as more immediate problems, and they are. Doctors warn that head injuries can harm a player's mental clarity even in the short term. When your brain isn't working right, uh, your body isn't working right either, and so you're more likely to be injured. Now that's an immediate concern for a, an athlete for all the reasons we talked about. You know, they want to keep playing, they want to get noticed by, by scouts and so forth. Researchers have found that athletes who suffered a concussion were 3.8 times more likely to get a muscle or ligament injury within 90 days of the concussion than non-concussed teammates. Immediate reporting and a full recovery can help reduce your risk. Performance in school is another issue. If your brain gets scrambled and you can't perform in your classes, you could lose eligibility. Uh, we're trying to get them to look out for teammates. You, you know, when you have a concussion, again, your brain isn't working right and you may not be able to make good decisions about whether to come out of the game or to report your symptoms, but a teammate that's next to you can see that going on and help you make that decision. You work and play with your teammates every day. You have each other's back. Making sure they report their head injuries keeps them safe and it keeps your team performing better. Athletes who try to play through a concussion are at a much higher risk for suffering a lower extremity injury. Concussions have a serious impact on your ability to play and practice at a peak level. In the video we're producing, for example, we're not really using fear appeals. We're making more of a rational or, or narrative appeal to them, you know, that, that you've been thinking all along that concussions are a long-term problem, but it's really a short-term problem that's going to interfere with the goals that you want to achieve. Uh, and I think that sort of approach is uh, uh, really the best one. I, it's probably not too easy to scare uh, most athletes, especially if they're masculine warriors. Uh, so I think a, a 
appeals to their reasoning and their, their wants and needs is the best way to go. The ideal outcome would be for all athletes to report any questionable hit to their athletic trainer so they can get checked out to reduce the incidence of concussions overall. Their next step is to test how athletes respond to watching the video. The computer tracks eye movement and heart rate. It tests whether the subject has an emotional response to what she's seeing in the video. If her heart rate goes up, or if her eyes linger on a certain scene, the researcher knows the subject is focusing on the message. Okay, so um, the second thing uh, you are going to do is to complete a survey. Um, and you see like some questions um, ask your understandings about the um, concussion related topics. There's a lot of research uh, out there on the factors that lead re athletes to report or not. So what we hope is that those research findings can be incorporated into educational programs, videos like the ones we're trying to do, uh, practices, best practices for the, the training and coaching staffs for dealing with concussion to overall increase the reporting rate. Even with high-tech helmets and good communication on the playing field, the best way to prevent serious head trauma may be to better educate athletes about the risks starting at a young age. The most important thing is, is that you really have to wait to play football. So if you're 12 and younger and you're playing football, your likelihood of getting CTE when you're older is significantly higher than those individuals who started playing football after 12. The earlier you can uh, get these practices, these reporting practices ingrained in children and, and, and teach them about the value of them, the better. Because, you know, those kids grow up to be high school athletes and then they wind up being college athletes and pro athletes. So the, st the sooner you start with change efforts like that, the better. From a helmet manufacturer or an equipment manufacturer standpoint, I think our responsibility is to do uh, sound research and make really good design and engineering decisions and fully test our products and put state-of-the-art protective gear on the field. It's, it's a matter of having the bigger picture. It's understanding the fundamental science behind concussion mechanism, which, which we don't currently have. It's understanding the relationship between these low-level impacts, frequency of impact, and CTE down the road. Um, so fueling that into our material science into how we make product um, is absolutely critical for us right now. So we all want to know, parents want to know, what can we do to decrease the incidence of concussions? Unfortunately, the only thing that's really been proven in the literature is to decrease the exposures. Uh, so decrease the number of times you get hit. Obviously, that'll decrease the times you get hit in the head. It can decrease the incidence of concussion. In the past few years, most of the attention paid to concussions and CTE has centered on American football but many sports create these risks. In fact, a recent study by a researcher at Northwestern University finds that girls playing high school soccer may face a higher risk of concussions than boys playing high school football. Now, the danger is there anytime the game creates a chance for a blow to the head, even as we saw with Stephanie in volleyball. I absolutely loved sports. Like, everyone seems to think that I I'm on this path because I absolutely am mad at sports, mad at volleyball. No, I loved volleyball. It was the best part because I was so competitive and it was a way to, to express that. And I think sports is great, especially for a young person. And I would totally recommend going to sports. But what I would talk about is I would talk about the injuries because if you have a broken leg or a broken arm, you're not going to go back into the game. You're not going to play. It's just obvious, but it's not so obvious when it's your head because it's an invisible injury. You can't see it and you can feel it, but you can't see it. So I would talk to them about the importance of that. I would also talk to the parents about the importance of head trauma because it's really when they're that young, it's up to the parents to step in. Hopefully the athletes realize that this is the only brain you get. So. Our advice to patients and athletes when we talk to them is if you don't feel right, if you get hit in the head, come be evaluated. And historically, people are afraid to come to the doctors because they don't want the doctors to hold them out. They want to be able to play their game that, that's going to give them their opportunity to go to the next level and provide for their families. And so a lot of people have been afraid to come get evaluated for their concussions. I think, I think the future really is, is early detection 
and some of the neuroimaging work that we're doing now and PET imaging will allow, hopefully, for some kind of therapeutic modalities that can help treat these symptoms so we don't have the Aaron Hernandez's and um, these, a lot of these players who just go through major rage um, and don't know how to control themselves. But this disease takes a long time to progress. And once you have it, you cannot stop it. Now thanks for watching Catalyst, our show about how science looks for answers and solutions to problems in our lives. I'm Professor Vanessa Ruiz, and because science always has new challenges to tackle, we'll be back soon with more stories. Catalyst is supported by Knowledge Enterprise Development at Arizona State University. Advancing entrepreneurship, innovation, discovery, and knowledge for the public good.